Hi everybody, we're launching an interview series with various financial experts and our first guest is none other than Michael Creedon. Hi Michael, really nice seeing you and thank you for taking the time today to, to speak with us. I'm really, really happy to have you here. As I said, I'm starting this uh, video interviews. You're our first guest um, in this series to try to help the, to educate you know crypto people especially as i noticed there are many younger guys here who don't have much experience or probably even any experience before the crypto investing so the idea is really to share some experience that you have from the traditional markets and yeah show some uh, show some uh, information that are relevant but before we start, maybe you can briefly introduce yourselves, uh, yourself, not just the crypto thing, but in general, who you are, what do you do, how did you start in the finance and so on? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much <clears throat> for having me. It's great to be with you guys and your, and your viewers and listeners. And, uh, and I'm a big fan of Solidum and, and the work that you and your partners do. Um, I always check it out on, on, online and you know, on social media. And I think you guys do a great job and your, your content is really, really uh, outstanding. And, you know, there's so, there's such a lack of, you know, object, like objective research analysis in, in the world. And I think that you guys are one of the very few places that sort of, you know, feed that. So I'm happy about what you're doing. But yeah, my background, you know, I grew up here, I grew up in Chicago where I live now and, and, and spent most of my career at the at the Chicago Board of Trade and Chicago Mercantile Exchange, trading primarily U.S. interest rates. So I'm I basically a bond trader for about 20 years, mm -hmm. um, and so I know you know I, I learned a lot about um, the Federal Reserve and interest rate policy, and and you know I have a lot of trading experience. I started a firm and and traded myself for you know 15 years actively, and then became more of the you know was more of the management management side of the business and so i manage people as well um but before that i did write for bloomberg and time magazine as a journalist and i've always enjoyed writing um and so in 2017 i did decide it was you know interest rates had been low for a very long time it was just ready to do something different so i started looking at crypto very closely and i realized like you guys have there's no good research out there, very little. So I did start a website and I also started writing on LinkedIn and I quickly decided, you know, I don't really want to manage a website. It's not really my goal, but I, I just, I kept writing on LinkedIn. So I write every day. I, yeah. I haven't taken a day off from writing since February, 2018 when I started <laughs> and uh, I just enjoy it. It's just a hobby, you know? And, and so but you know because i've written so much my network has grown very very large and you know i have I contacts all around the world now mm -hmm. and it's great and i you know so anyway so last year or no excuse me earlier this year i did start with drawbridge lending and our entire team here is like myself has traded for many many years so yeah. what we're doing very simply is applying a lot of strategies and principles of risk management that we learned throughout our careers we're applying those to digital assets Mm -hmm. And in the specifically what we're doing is we use option strategies um, to lay off risk. And so, and I can get into that later, but so, you know, we, like, we're all very bullish on the space. Mm -hmm. We believe Bitcoin is, at least I do, I believe Bitcoin has become a global currency, even though it's still a very small one in relative terms, but we're, you know, we're building for the future. And we think that, you know, proper risk management and the use of options will give lenders and investors and borrowers all kinds of options and flexibility so mm -hmm. that's a brief well maybe not that brief but that's a little overview <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks michael so how did you really start in finance traditional finance i mean before crypto what dragged you into it yeah you know well it's funny that's a good question i was a journalist at the time i was living in sydney and at, at that time i i realized you know I'm, i probably don't want to spend the rest of my life working as a reporter even though i did enjoy it but as you probably know, there's, there, you know, there's three large exchanges in Chicago, or at least there were back then, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the Chicago Board of Trade, and the Chicago Board of Options Exchange, SIBO. And so naturally, a lot of people I grew up with and went to school with and their families and fathers and uncles and aunts and sisters worked at these exchanges. So one of my good friends had started his career 
right out of college and was doing well. So he basically hired me. And the funny thing is, I remember thinking, like, when I took the job, I was like, this, this is never going to work out. I won't like it. I won't be any good at it. You know, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It was like a bad, it was like when somebody dares you to do something. And I said, oh, I'll try it. But I really did enjoy it. I like markets. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoy markets uh, a great deal. And I continue to, I mean, I obviously don't trade actively like I used to, but I'm, I'm a student of the game. I'm always watching the S&P 500, the currencies, equities, of course, Bitcoin, all coins. I mean, for me, it's all, it's almost like a giant chess game, you know, mm-hmm. and there's so much going on. Um, and, and for me, it's, of course, and, you know, it's the data. You look at, you study the data. And, you know, I, I see a lot of people on Twitter getting in these arguments about stuff. And that, to me, that's meaningless. Mm. You know, you try to look at what the underlying data is and, and make a decision. Now, in crypto, it's challenging because these aren't, they don't have balance sheets and they don't have clients and they don't have EBITDA. So it's a little, it's hard to make decisions. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, the market struggled for quite a bit of time here but you know even though bitcoin has done much better this year mm. so what would you then you said a lot of things about you know data that it's missing here what would be for example your suggestion for somebody who is deciding to enter the crypto world for the first time to make some initial investments how would you let's say suggest to approach this market to be an active trader to maybe just buy and hold it for some time and any thoughts on this I don't know. It's it. I, I think it's extremely challenging to trade unless you have a professional apparatus. You need enough. You need sufficient capital. You need risk p- parameters. I, I guess it, I know this sounds discouraging to say, but I, I I almost would. I would. I don't want to say I would discourage people from doing it, but I I think that you really need to examine the strategy. I mean, to the extent that it's possible. And I don't know if it is, you know, you, I would encourage people to look for opportunities to join an organization that has some capital, some rules and compliance, maybe some mentorship, mm. um, because to do it on your own is challenging, not just be, not simply because it's just hard to trade, but because you're, it's almost an uphill, it's an uphill battle um, because there's, there's a fragmentation of information for lack of a better word. And um so it's very challenging. For example, one, one, and I know you've written about this and we both kind of have similar views, I think. You know, there's a lot of fake volume. Fake volume is very, very dangerous. Mm. It's very pernicious and it's, it's very misleading. So people can see a lot of volume going into a coin. They might think that that's a story, but it's all pump and dump. I mean, not just pump and dump. It's just fake volume. And it's there to, it's there to deceive people and trick people. It's very dangerous. And, it, it, you know, in this country, it's probably illegal, I'm, I'm assuming. <laughs> the, I would encourage actors in the space. See, what makes, like in this country, what, all the trading organizations are, and, and trading entities and exchanges are self-regulating bodies. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think, like if Binance and Coinbase and Kraken and OKX and KuCoin, they should be coming together, presenting a, a systematic rules-based system and then present it to global regulators and say, mm-hmm. here's how we're going to make this a fair level playing system. So mm-hmm. there's no games and gimmickry. And then they go to the regulators and then the regulators can say, we don't like this, change that. But the industry needs to mature and grow up. There's too many scams. There's too many charlatans and and, and fraudsters. And it's clearly hurt the industry, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, But look, like things will, I mean, I'm very confident that over time things will improve. Certainly in this country, we have a very, very strong regulatory regime. Anybody trading crypto, selling crypto coins, any of that stuff, is, it's highly regulated. And the purpose of the regulation is to protect retail investors mm-hmm. primarily yeah. um, and make sure that people follow the laws. So, you know, and that's, that's what will happen here. I, I think, I don't know what will happen elsewhere, but, you know, you can see in this country, uh, cryptocurrencies have become a very rule, are becoming a very rules-based, um, you know, 
yeah, uh, industry, and that's a good thing. It's important because, as I said, the regulators came to the existence because of so many frauds in the traditional markets, and they came to protect the regular investor, the small guy, actually. And that's why I also agree with you totally that the regulation is important, not just in the U.S., but globally, for sure, because this will help to really mature the, the industry and it will protect the investors you know, yeah. there's so many, so many rogue players still on the market. But back to the topic of really to somebody new approaching the market, probably Bitcoin is the safest bet for to start and then slowly learn more about it, explore more about it and try to, do, let's say, get some real knowledge before you decide to make some investments. This is something that would be, let's say, some sound advice for the start of course anything you say here is not investment advice obviously eh? we yeah. have the disclaimers as well but in general really really bitcoin is the most mature it has some sort of proof of concept at least we see the big guys coming in backed and uh, fidelity and all the other guys and we believe their investors will start with bitcoin definitely the first and yeah. altcoins are really struggling for some time now uh, yeah and well, I mean, for me, obviously, just speaking for myself and not, of course, not giving um, advice. I, I mean, I do have my Series 3, so I have a license to, to sell futures and options in this country. But nonetheless, um, you know, when I got involved last year, I got very enamored by altcoins. And, and it was, you know, it just was a total disaster. I mean, nothing worked out at all. But, I, you know, I fortunately, I... I, I Relative, you know, I had pretty prudent risk management. I, I didn't bet enormously, but it didn't work out at all. And so my position, my my thinking has evolved. You know, as I said, I watch this stuff every day. I write about it every day. I'm speaking to people every day. Uh, I've become, I wouldn't say a, a full blown Bitcoin maximalist, but I'd say that Bitcoin for me is is, you know, it. it, it if you're in digital assets and you don't have an investment in Bitcoin, I. I don't know. I don't know. I wouldn't, under, you know, Bitcoin is like indispensable and it has to be, it has to be a part of my portfolio in digital assets um, because I believe, and the reason is because I think it's already become a global currency. It's not a big one. It's still a very small one, but it is in my mind, a global currency. I think for all the other coins, literally every single one of them from Ethereum on down, they still haven't demonstrated to me that they that they will for sure be here for you know forever so you know 50 years 25 years i'm open to being wrong about that and i hope i hope dozens or hundreds of altcoins make it i just don't know which ones will, will be i can't tell you i don't know but i think you know back to Sorry, yeah, back to, by the way, I, I just want to mention, and I hope that people can see it. I absolutely love that poster behind you. It's just awesome. <laughs> it's so great. I wish, could you send me one of those? No, I'm just kidding. But that is so awesome. Our video, um, video wall that we use for our video recordings, usually for monthly commentaries and stuff like that. that it's funny. That is, it was prepared by our back office team. And at, at that time, I just said, look, just... Uh, oh get the logos of top, top 25 coins on the market and put them on. And then, you know, some people come to our office and say, look, what is WeChain doing here? Wow. I, I absolutely. Know, but the guys just put it on. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love that. And, um, uh, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, back to, you know, I was lucky when I was younger. I had a – I had – I traveled a lot and were, I studied overseas I worked overseas. I lived in Africa. I lived in Australia. I lived in Central America. I traveled a lot in Europe, been to Asia. Um, and so those experiences sort of shaped my life, you know, and, and so, and I've always read a lot about history and current events and stuff and, and politics and, you know, national defense and stuff. Yeah. And I just, I, my, my central view is, Countries like the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, they don't necessarily need Bitcoin, in my opinion, because we have a strong currency, strong currency, strong economy, strong defense, strong judiciary, rule of law, and, and you know, so and a strong banking system, and you know, so I think it's it's a it's a longer you know proposition to make those things integrate here. However. If you look around the world at places like Venezuela, Argentina, Zimbabwe, Iran, 
you know, the former mm-hmm. Yugoslavia. I don't know what's going on there, but you know, the places like you know, the Yugoslavia, my wife is from Ukraine, mm-hmm. you know, places like that where they've had real currency crisis or, or interventions and all these kinds of problems. I'll, t- I'll tell you a story. I'll, I'll just give you an example. My wife's grandfather, well, you know, she was born in Ukraine and he was an importer exporter in, in the former Soviet Union for his whole life. And he had a very nice career. And when the former, when the Soviet Union said the game's over, Yeltsin said, we're done here. The, 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 uh, the ruble collapsed and the, their family was, lost everything. They lost their fortune. And, and people like that, you know, like we don't have the, that doesn't happen in the United States. Even 2008, as bad as it was, mm-hmm. look around our country today. People are back on their feet mm-hmm. for the most part. And, but, mm-hmm. but places like Ukraine, as you know, because you're not too far from there, mm-hmm. people are saying, get my money out of the Hervinia. I don't want all my money in Hervinia. No way. And so they're looking for alternatives. Yeah, they're looking for alternatives. Yep. Yeah, I want to say about Turkey recently. You know that they have also huge inflation, and what they do, you know, they have capital controls, so you cannot even buy any foreign currency. You're stuck with the lira, and you cannot send it out uh, outside the country. So you can just sit and watch your well right. diminished and here is where bitcoin comes in for sure <laughs> i mean i don't want to sound like a radical or something or che guevara or some crazy stuff Karl marx but like currencies to some extent and maybe to a large extent are political weapons and now i mean obviously they're but they're, they're and they protect the political leaders around them and the institutions and and, and but it's 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 often at odds with the people on the street you know what I mean? You look at the revolutions in the 90s, you know, and, and when all their peaceful protests were throughout Eastern Europe. And, and I, think, I think Bitcoin is like the quietest revolution we've ever seen. Mm. And it's, it, it just grows step by step, hour by hour. And, you know, I think of this concept of Moore's Law about how semiconductors or chips, you know, they get better every 18 months. And Bitcoin is moving forward. It's advancing. It's not an even shot straight higher in terms of price or adoption. But I think I, to me, it's inevitable that some currency step in and become a global currency. And right now, I don't see anything really legitimately competing with Bitcoin yet. That could change. That could, I mean, you could have me back in two years and we could be talking about Litecoin. It's possible. I, I, I don't know. I but mean, right now, I think Bitcoin's got a huge lead. People forget that all these crypto projects are actually startups and the majority will fail and some of them already failed. And it's really like a VC investing is it's a high risk game, definitely. So um, what I wanted to say is really, as we agree for sure that for a new entrant to the market, it's really important to educate himself or herself to maybe start Bitcoin and then really try to get some more knowledge to learn and slowly tipping to some potentially other digital assets, but really get some knowledge before. I'll, give, I'll share my story. Uh, I, I started investing in the traditional markets in April 2000. This was just when the dot-com bubble started bursting, really. And I had yeah. no idea about the economy at that time. I was in my early 20s, you know, still a student. And somebody told me, look, Nokia, it's a great company. I mean, it's really now it's an opportunity to invest in it. It just lost 25% of its value. It's a good, good buying opportunity. And I was working at a mobile operator at that time also as a student. And we all had Nokias, you know, around the world. Nokia was like Apple currently in the in the phones market. So my common sense said, look, this makes sense. We all have Nokia. They are the rules of the world here. And I just bought a lot of shares of Nokia with my savings and lost over 50% in the next few months. So I was a totally ignorant investor, but I always say it was a really great lesson because it was at the beginning of my investing career. And these are the, let's say I would say the cheapest lessons because if you tend to have luck for a long period and then you're starting in more and more risk, what happened many crypto investors in 2017, you know, they're just taking on more and more risk, really. And then you get burned heavily. So it's, it's good to have uh, some experience early on. And what, it's, what is a lesson from my side, first educate yourself and then only start investing. Not just because everybody is investing, you join in. You know? We know that once Bitcoin goes over 20,000, and it will happen for sure. The media will start again, you know, publishing stories, Bitcoin, 
yeah. over 20,000 again. It's a new all-time high. It's, I don't know, 50% in the last month. And again, people will start acting like, you know, the ship. And it's really important to, to I think, to educate before investing. Yeah, I mean, as you, as you, as you know, I mean, you, I know you've read some of my stuff and I try to be very, very, um, I never talk about price and things like that and, and I never make recommendations, but since we're, you know, since we're having a show and you're, you're interviewing me, I mean, I, you know, look, the price itself doesn't mean anything. 10,000. I mean, I look at, I look at the, you know, quote unquote market cap and you know, that's what, and, and, you know, it's only, a, it's about $200 billion. That's just not that much money in the global. I mean, in the, it's a lot of money to me, you and I, yeah. <laughs> if you and I had 200 billion, we'd be, we'd be okay. But I mean, when you compare it to global currencies, I, I don't even know how you would measure it against the dollar. I don't even know what the dollar, you know, what's the market cap, the dollar is. I mean, what is it? A hundred trillion dollars. I have no idea. Yeah, and so I, I, I think that, I think that there's, there's a case to be made that there's, you know, substantial upside potentially, but again, it all hinges on the acceptance of it as a global currency and the adoption of it. And then, you know, that needs to start happening. Mm. Um, I have some friends that are consultants and I've been talking to them about, you know, what's it going to take for Hyatt or, or, you know, I don't even McDonald's or anywhere you go to you know, the hotels or you go to out to dinner and you can pay for Bitcoin and really pay for Bitcoin. I don't mean, and there's nothing against it. You know, people have Bitcoin on their phone and they buy something and it converts to euros and, you know, that, that's fine. But eventually I think retailers, why wouldn't retailers accept Bitcoin? I mean, why wouldn't they? I mean, you want to go buy a Tesla, pay in Bitcoin. You want to go like anything, like any way you spend money. And when that happens, when you can spend Bitcoin anywhere and pay bills in Bitcoin, when that starts to happen, if it starts to happen, then, you know, then the demand for to own Bitcoin should go up and, you know, and then it goes from there. But, but you know, we'll see how it unfolds. We'll see. I mean, Bact is doing this, is planning to do this after this launch of the exchange and custody. I know the second big part of the plan is really the partnership with Starbucks, as you know. And they plan to offer purchasing uh, with Bitcoin across all Starbucks shops around, across the states and even, I think, further on. So this will be interesting. But my, my concern is really do people currently buy Bitcoin to spend it or do they buy it to, you know, hold it like a s store of value? I, I, think, I think more to buy. I mean, in my experience, people are holding it as a store of value more than more than spending it. I, mean, I don't, for me, I mean, I'm trying to think, I don't even know if I've ever really used Bitcoin to pay for anything. I mean, maybe I have, maybe I have a little bit, but um, it's usually, I mean, really that's like maybe you're sending, you know, $200 to a friend in, in Bitcoin and that's, you know, that so, but you know, it, it's only your crypto friends or something. Yeah. <laughs> but um, so I haven't, but I mean, I think that I've, I've decided like, look, I want to own this much Bitcoin. And I just, you know, like I said, I have young kids and I, I literally am thinking this would be a nice thing for them to have when they're in college or after college. Mm -hmm. It could be worth nothing. I have, I don't know, but I'm, I, the more I've read about it and been involved with the space, I've only become more convinced of Bitcoin's, you know, relevance in the world and not less. Mm -hmm. Even though there's, even though there's, there's plenty of flaws, but I've been overall, I, I'm just thinking that this is something that's going to be here for forever, you know, quite, quite frankly. Yeah, I read recently, I, I don't remember the name, but he said that the, the, let's say the slow pace of the design in Bitcoin protocols and the upgrades is actually um, something that's an advantage because when you see big institutions entering the market, they don't want things to move too fast and to try new things and, you know, fail with them. They want something to, that grows and develops more steadily and slowly so they believe that this is an advantage of bitcoin and bitcoin protocol and blockchain compared to others which yes. has to so this is also another topic okay yep. um what would be your if we go back to the investment topics uh, before we sum it up what would be your let's say what was your biggest mistake in investing where you, <laughs> besides losing money in outcomes like we all did probably but into the, something that really was a big lesson for you later on that that helps you as i said for me for example it was this 
a big loss at the beginning of my investments with Nokia loss that I did. It really helped me later on because it was always somewhere in the back, you know, reminding me, hey, take it quick, learn things, get educated before investing in whatever opportunities they um, actually I saw later on. No, it's a great question. I mean, I think that for me, you, you know, I guess one of the things I've learned over the years, um, making investments in private companies for me has not been a very fruitful exercise. Um, because what happens is you end up in a liquid assets, you don't have any voting rights and you can't, without liquidity, you really don't, there's not much you can do. Equity rights in this country are very weak anyway. They can be wiped out very fast. So that, that for me was probably the biggest general, you know, because it was, unfortunately, there's a few different instances. But I think that's, you know, that's what I do like about, that's why I think digital assets are, are very important, even though there's been so many mistakes, mm -hmm. because they do provide some level of liquidity mm -hmm. um, versus these locked up investments where you can't do anything. So I think a lot of entrepreneurs globally will continue to try to roll out whatever you call it, ICO, IEO, STO, whatever, whatever. But what they're trying to do is raise either equity or coins to build business and build a community. And, but but the, the people that are buying it, whether they're buying stock or some coins or whatever, they do get some level of util of, of liquidity. And that that's very attractive. That, and that's extremely attractive as an investor. I mean, I, you know, again, I probably made 10 private investments and I had no liquidity in any of them. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a shame because, you know, and, and I think that, that that model of private investment, I just don't think it's very attractive. So um, I think that a lot of people will, will look for, you know, and you see this, there's other exchanges around the world. They're not crypto, but where you can trade private shares and things like that. I think that there'll be a lot of growth in that area, both in crypto and non-crypto, mm -hmm. um, because now we have the tools to create these platforms, yeah. you know, to give people access to, you know, to let them trade that. So, but, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, I do think that people that are interested in, in Bitcoin, I mean, the biggest thing is to just continue to do res research and that's where, you know, organizations like yourself, um, you know, I'm always writing on LinkedIn. People are welcome to follow along there. You know, I, I'm, I'm big friends with the guys at ARCA, you know, Jeff Dorman and their team. Uh, shout out to them. I mean, the guys at The Block in New York, love what they're doing. They're awesome. Uh, Masari Capital, I think if I'm saying it right, they're great. Delphi Digital in New York, phenomenal. I mean, it's one after another. Who else am I forgetting? I just met with a team last week. They're called Token Daily great team so there are teams out there yeah. and um and, i mean to some extent you're probably all competing but the reality is there's so much room here exactly. there's so i mean there's yeah, come on there's plenty there. there's plenty of room for everybody yeah. and i don't see it as competition mm -hmm. in as much as you know you guys are all part of the same ecosystem and yeah. you know you should check out those guys i just mentioned i'll make yeah. those intros to you a lot of them already thanks and yeah I good i mean they're all great i mean i give a shout out to every one of them it's such a small ecosystem that we need to help each other to really make it to something big. As I said, it's two billion market cap to 60. Okay, but this is still nothing. You know, it's peanuts. Yeah, right. We need to work together to bring it to the mainstream in the next years for sure. Okay, Michael. So I see you're really passionate about a lot of things, especially crypto. But what are your passions outside of crypto? Oh gosh, what else? Well, I, I play fantasy football. That's one, and I'm yeah. losing every week. But uh, you know, uh, honestly, you know, I mean, I have young kids, and so that's really fun. You know, my my son is a baseball player, and nice. and I I've I've forgotten how much I enjoy baseball. You know, being out with because I just didn't play since I was like 15, mm. and so that's one thing. And then my daughter is really into art, and so she's always drawing, and you know, it's just fun. Those are those are the things that. That, that keep me, you know, occupied outside of work. Um, but again, I, I, I continue to write, you know, I, I, what I'm hoping to do, I don't know if I'll ever do it, is take, you know, a year's worth of my writing and my posts on LinkedIn and try to turn it into like basically a book it would be like a diary almost. And, you know, and so that would be something that I, that's kind of like a, a bucket list goal is to actually get this get this out there i mean the funny thing is it's like the book is already written i've already done the writing so now it's it's not about you know saying i want to write a book oh, the book's written i just need to like consolidate it and package it up and see if there's any interest but you know i've been very uh flattered 
by the, you know, the, the responses I've gotten over the, you know, a couple year and a half I've done this. So many nice people have reached out to tell me that they like reading what I'm writing. That's very gratifying. You know, it's just nice to, that, you know, it's nice to have a hobby that you can share with other people to some extent, you know what I mean? Mm. So. Very good. Very good. So thanks, Michael. Really, uh, let's sum it up. I think thanks for taking the time to sharing uh, your experiences from the markets. It's, I also follow you all the time, read everything that you write on LinkedIn. It's really insightful. And yeah, let's keep doing this to educate investors and to help this ecosystem to grow and become something really big. Great. Thanks, Michael. Thanks again. Okay. For taking your time and all the best. See you. Bye to everybody in Slovenia, my favorite country <laughs> in Europe. <laughs> See you guys. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.